quantumlaserpointers.com. Quantum Laser Pointers brings you the infamous double slit experiment right in the palm of your hand. In 1801, English physicist Thomas Young performed this experiment to determine if light was a particle or a wave. A laser shines a coherent beam of light through a film disc containing two parallel slits. Light striking the wall behind the slits produces a classic interference pattern. This surprising result means light passes through the parallel slits not as particles, but as waves. Visit our website or subscribe to our YouTube channel now. Be among the first to see our new line of double slit lasers, quantumlaserpointers.com. We're very lucky to have um, Chris Clark here to, to talk about quantum theory and consciousness tonight, and he's really going to give us a taste of the short course by talking, um, giving a kind of introduction to, to, to where quantum theory and, and consciousness can um, interweave in, their, in, their, in, in our separate understandings about them. And w in, our, in our inquiry that we have at the college, and especially on the MSc in Holistic Science, we're often um, asking deep questions. So today we've been reading essays and having dialogues about the nature of wholeness and how to communicate it. Um, but Chris has um, come to, to questions of wholeness um, through a def very different avenue in that he was um, professor of mathematics at Southampton University and um, w was very much deep into a mathematical worldview before, at the age of 40, as he told me this evening, suddenly having a shift in, into a completely different knowing about the world, a much more um, spiritual and um, em, 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 emotional knowing about how one can understand directly from e experiencing the world. And um, from then on he wrote some amazing papers about how you can understand um, quantum theory as, as the knowing of the particle, rather than there is a knowledge to be gained about some static entity. And, um, um, and so I, I got to know Chris through finding his website and understanding that um, what he is doing has tremendous relevance to, to the questions we are discussing at Schumacher College, and yet he's come through this very different um, avenue and gateway to, to get to the same point and the same questions about how can we expand the, way, the ways we have of understanding the world. And so um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Chris and for us to listen to this very fascinating talk. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for coming and listening to me, <laughs> and um, I hope you stick the course, because uh, <laughs> I, I want to try and actually uh, explain something about uh, what quantum theory is, and something about uh, what consciousness is, and something about how they are connected, and I think these three topics are probably the least understood and the most difficult to explain that are around. Uh, and I think it's generally reckoned that attempting to give a popular exposition of quantum theory is really courting disaster. So um, I, I would like you to assist me in, in this perilous task uh, by signalling if I have totally lost you, uh, by waving your hand in the air or uh, frowning or beating your fist on your brow or whatever uh, <laughs> means you think might be appropriate uh, and uh, I, I will try and rescue you. I think we, we should have a fair amount of time available uh, to sort of explore things at the end but we'll, we'll, we'll see how we get on. Um, so um, quantum theory and consciousness and um, first of all um, what are quantum theory and what is consciousness? Um, certainly they're, they're important. Um,
consciousness is the most basic thing that uh, we have. We are, consciousness is us, if you like. Uh, it is our window on the whole of being. So uh, consciousness is absolutely at the root of being human. Of be and I would like to extend this to other species as well, as you will see later on. Um, but uh, then there is quantum theory. Uh, and why? What has uh, consciousness and quantum theory, what have they got to do with each other? Um, so, f first of all, we need to ask, well, what is quantum theory? And this is what I'll start off uh, by trying to give you an idea ab uh, about. I think probably if you get through this bit, then the next bit um, might be more downhill going. Um, there's uh, an enormous gulf here. I want to sort of really explain w uh, part of what the confusion is. There's an enormous gulf between, on the one hand, uh, professional physicists and, um, on, on the other hand, people whose main concern is to uh, go from uh, quantum theory to more, a more spiritual understanding of things and uh, just using quantum theory as a sort of jumping off point. I'm fairly passionate about um, having to of the necessity of actually engaging scientists and uh, drawing on the whole wealth of quantum theory uh, as, as, a, as a whole theory. And so you'll find, in fact, that uh, there are a lot of expositions of quantum theory which, uh, first of all, they're, they're all different, uh, and this is one thing you've got to put up with. There's a lot of scientific accounts of quantum theory which are all different, uh, and uh, lots of contradictions between them. So it's not, a, not a, an easy territory to cross. Um, so I, I want to try and give what I think is the sort of mainstream aspects of quantum theory uh, as, as recognized in um, uh, physics as a whole, uh, but with a warning that you will probably hear different accounts of it. In fact, I know you will certainly hear at least uh, two more different accounts of it uh, in, in, in the course of the course that's going on. Um, so the ideas about what quantum theory are they uh, come in two extremes, really. So one, one extreme, there is the view that quantum theory... Right, I need to stand somewhere where I'm not blocking the screen from people at this side. Um, one view is that um, uh, quantum theory is just about the physics of particles. It's, it's a uh, complicated theory, more sophisticated than ordinary Newtonian theory about how particles behave, and that's it. At the other extreme... Um, there's uh, the, the idea that quantum theory really is the key to, to everything in the universe. That in some way quantum theory uh, is some, something universal, uh, a way into universal mind covering the entire cosmos. Um, and I'm going to be sort of somewhere in, in, in between the two of these things. Um, the... So let's, let's sort of get started on some specific points of this. Um, before I, I want to outline a few points which suggest that quantum theory really must have something interesting in it, whatever it is. The first of these um, is uh, that when it, whatever you read about quantum theory, it goes on about the observer. Now who or what the observer is, is a contested issue. But, um, okay, we are observers. I mean, you know, we look at things, we experience things. So observers are us. So uh, if, uh, if observers are essential, if this is sort of what it's all about, then um, this sounds as though it's potentially interesting and could well be, have a bit to do with consciousness. Um, then uh, there's uh, something which really has only got dominant in the last... Uh, five, ten years or so, um, there's been a, a burgeoning of interest in quantum cosmology, in the applications uh, of quantum theory to the very early stages of the universe. This has been around at a theoretical level for quite a long time, 30 years or so. Um, 
But with the um, recent launch of um, satellites, one particular satellite, uh, which I'll say a bit about later, this is now being turned into a purely theoretical uh, way of investigation into something which has a, a practical observational backup. So that means that quantum theory not only deals with little things, it deals with the entire cosmos of which we are ourselves part. So it's um, saying that actually whatever you think about it, uh, it's something which really is global at all length scales. Um, and then um, finally, and for me what's most interesting actually, is that fairly recent work over the last 10 years or so um, suggests that the best way of looking at quantum theory is to say that quantum theory suggests that we ought to use actually a different sort of logic. Um, and th the sort of logic which uh, is thought of in this context is the sort of logic which some psychologists have been looking at as a way of understanding the intuitive part of our mind. So there's an interesting sort of uh, link there which um, s starts to suggest that there's some quite big shift going on here in, in the way we need to think about things. We need to adopt a, a different sort of logic. So that's the sort of um, picture in, in sort of very broad brush terms. So now I want to get down to the, to the nitty gritty of quantum theory and, and tell you a bit about it. And I think the easiest thing is to make a comparison between quantum theory and the theory which came before quantum theory. So um, I'm going to look at comparing classical theory to quantum theory. And the, the reason why these particular dates are on there um, is that um, I, I've chosen the start of classical theory as the, the date of the publication of Newton's Principia. And we could probably just tweak this a little in a bit in that direction. Um, and uh, at the other end, uh, um, I've taken 1926 as the point where Schrodinger's uh, wave equation entered the scene uh, as the sort of shift point between uh, when people were thinking classically and when people were uh, thinking in a, in a more quantum theoretical sort of way. Um, so, for, um, First of all, um, on the classical side, uh, you're probably uh, much more familiar with this than you are with uh, quantum theory. Um, Newtonian classical physics was about the idea that uh, the world is essentially matter. Um, originally, um, in, in the case of uh, Descartes and Newton, it was matter and spirit, but then spirit was whittled away and more and more properties of spirit were sort of moved over to the matter side. Uh, so essentially, now for the average scientist, the world is uh, matter, a mechanical array of inert objects governed by mathematical laws. Uh, and uh, if you like, as an optional extra, there's spirit sort of stuck onto it. <laughs> <laughs> Loosely interacting with it. <laughs> um, then on the quantum side, um, things are inevitably murky, and I'll be talking a, a, a bit more solidly about the, the murkiness of, of quantum theory in, uh, in the course. But there's, um, there was a big debate in the middle of the development of quantum theory uh, about uh, the sort of status of quantum theory, and the, the dominant uh, view is what one philosopher of quantum theory uh, calls veiled reality, that um, if, if there is something there, as it were, underneath the mathematics, it, we cannot get at it or visualise it. It is veiled. Uh, and so um, quantum, I think the majority would say that um, if, you, if you try and approach quantum theory through uh, a, a, a rational understanding, um, you are not going to get to the bottom of it. There is going to be a point where uh, your rational understanding says, well, there's something in there, but there's no way in which we can get at what it is. Um, and 
the, however, the, what gives us the clue to actually doing quantum theory is that there's a parallel between quantum theory and the classical theory. They look totally differently and different. Mathematically, they're totally different. Conceptually, they're totally different. Um, but there are, there are links across um, between, b between the two sides. Uh. Mm, please, yes. You said that one couldn't approach quantum um, theory in using logic, the logic we have developed over hundreds of years. Now, is that because the particles are too small and we'll never <coughs> be able to see them? Or is it that they are essentially different in their structure or, or whatever? Um, uh, the, types the, of matter? Uh, the, 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 the question was, sort of what's, what's the real reason why you can't get to, uh, to the bottom of this? Uh, is, it, is it because the, the particles are too small and you can't, you can't get under them? The, the, reason, the, reason is, um, the reason is a logical one, in, in classical logic. Um, there is um, a theorem which is nothing like as famous as it ought, as it ought to be, the Koch and Specker theorem. Hands up everyone who, anyone who knows or has heard of the Koch and Specker theorem. Yeah, yeah, right. no, yes, yes, two people have heard of the Koch and Specker theorem. Right. Um, the, uh, the Koch and Specker theorem um, says, in a sense, that quantum theory is fundamentally inconsistent. Uh, that if you write down the properties of uh, all the particles um, of, of any given particle or any given quantum system, you can prove that these properties are not, con uh, not compatible with each other. Um, so it, it's, it, that's the nature of the barrier. Uh, and this is why you actually have to shift the logic in order to get, get beyond that. Um, I'm delighted to, uh, to hear that two people know about the Koch and Specker. <laughs> <laughs> we are in the, don't, don't tell the, the, the uh, course people, but I'm actually going to try and give them the proof in the course. But, uh, <laughs> um, the, um, so where are we? Yes, right, press on. Um, the... I've already mentioned this thing about the observer. Observation plays a crucial role in the appearance of the world. This is different from the classical uh, w picture. In the classical picture, the universe is there, whether there's anyone to look at it or not, as it were. Um, and uh, where do we go next? This is the problem. What is observation? We have this thing, the observer, um, but what is the observer? Does it have to be human? Uh, can if not, how far do you go? Um, what, what's this all about? So I'm going to move on to that next. Um, and the, this leads on to consciousness. Um, I'll be saying in a moment about the way in which consciousness was brought in to uh, explain this idea of the observer. And consciousness raises up a whole lot of other mysteries. What is consciousness? How do you define it? How does it work? Uh, you're essentially explaining one mystery by another mystery, which maybe uh, doesn't get you very far. Um, and finally, um, there's still a so what at the end of it, and uh, I'm going to get to the so what at the end. Uh, after we've been through all this struggle to try and understand all this, uh, well, what good does it actually do us here in, in this place, faced with global warming, faced with breakdown of society in many places? Uh, what has this got to do with actually being human here and now? If, if it's no good for that, then you know, I might as well pack up shop. Um, so, um, let's move in on this thing, the observer. Um, the, this idea was crystallised by von Neumann, who uh, said the following, that... Um, in, 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 physics, in physical processes concerned with quantum theory and with small objects, there are two different sorts of processes going on in the physics. One process is uh, a, a smooth deterministic change which takes place uh, in the universe, in particles, in whatever it is you're studying. Very like Newtonian uh, physics, 
Uh, there are equations which tell you how uh, a system is developing and moving and changing. It might be a particle moving, it might be uh, a particle moving around an atom, whatever. Very light Newtonian theory, more complicated, more bells and whistles on it, but similar in spirit. And then there is a second, quite different process, according to von Neumann, um, namely uh, this thing which is often referred to as collapse. Uh, which is uh, sudden, it's random, there's no way in which you can tell what the collapse is to, there's a, a, a sudden change takes place and it takes place when there is, is an observation. Um, so uh, what's all that about? I want to take um, a, a, a simple example of the way this sort of thing happens and somewhere here I think I've got a pointer, yes I have. Um, this, this is a schematic diagram of one of the early um, very important experiments done on quantum theory. Um, uh, this lot must be thought of as being in a vacuum. At the end here there is a furnace which um, heats up and evaporates silver um, fairly slowly so that uh, atoms of silver are allowed into this region here. They then pass through the poles of a magnet and uh, they're deflected by the magnet. Now, uh, the, the, the furnace here is sending out atoms which are, atoms, uh, the silver atoms happen to be like little magnets. They've got a north pole and a south pole. And um, the, the furnace is sending them out in random orientations where the north and the south pole is. So you would expect that um, they would be scattered in different directions by this. Some of them would go up, some of them would go down, some of them would uh, go somewhere in between. But what happens is that you find that um, either they go up or they go down with nothing in between, which is, which is curious. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of that and why that is. The important thing is that um, what, what is going on with uh, a, a single atom? Just think of one single atom coming out here, along here. According to the, the, the standard bit of quantum theory, the smooth uh, evolution that I was talking about before, um, the, uh, what happens is something which is um, totally ridiculous and um, unvisualizable. And this is the business about the, 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 the uh, unvisualizability of quantum theory. Uh, that when we're out here, the atom is both up there and it's down there, and it's nowhere in between. Um, and uh, if it's the, if the physics of the thing uh, is that <coughs> um, it's, it comes along to here, which is a photographic plate which registers it, and uh, it, it registers both up there, um, and uh, it, it registers at the top but not at the bottom, and also it registers at the bottom and not the top, get that? Um, and nothing in between. Um, then this magical uh, process one comes in uh, and eliminates one of the possibilities uh, and uh, that's an observation which has taken place and it's either produced one at the top or one at the bottom. And this is the fundamental paradox and problem and obscurity in, in quantum theory, what, what goes on in this. A little bit after, uh, and, and when, when this happened, um, uh, I mean people sort of swallowed it but nobody was happy with it. Um, then after that, um, uh, London and Bauer came in and they suggested that um, the, the human observer, um, and uh, they, they were specifically talking about humans, and this again is an issue which uh, we need to look at, um, uh, the, the human observer uh, come, becomes involved in this and the human observer is able to do it because uh, he has consciousness. Uh, it would be he at uh, uh, 1939. Um, <laughs> would, would really be all he as well in 1939, not just linguistically. Uh, but anyway, um, so the, uh, the observer comes in, looks at it, and it is the observer who causes this, uh, this thing to happen. Um, and I mean, when, when this was... Uh, so when, observe, the second point then, then, then we are. Th that is the real observation, and at that stage, we are. Uh, that's what causes just one image to appear for each atom. 
So each atom just has one, one image in the usual way, uh, and then the next atom comes along, and that might be on the bottom, or whatever. Yes? No, no, it's, it's just the fact of observation. Wh which one it is, is random. It's just the fact that it is being observed which makes it do either one or the other. It, it, and it doesn't make any, any difference whether the observer wants it to be up top or wants it down, to be down below. This is actually quite important because, uh, I mean, there's, there is a, a, a lot of you know, quite careful and serious um, work done in parapsychology to, uh, to see whether, in fact, it is possible to, to influence this. And the evidence is actually that um, statistically, it, it, is, it is statistically significant that you can make very small changes, but that the strength of the effect is very, very tiny. Uh, and this is, this is, this is a qu a quite an important clue to, to what might or might not be going on, but that's a, another story altogether, I'm afraid. How do you know that it's so when the observer's not there, this process is different. You can't know because you can only know by observing it. Yeah. <laughs> <So> <laughs> 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 it, it, it's Alice in the Wonderland, isn't it? <laughs> um, the, 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 the point is that... Um, <laughs> uh, Quantum theory is, is an absurdly accurate theory. I mean, it, as a means of predicting what is going on and describing it, it is, it is quite incredibly accurate. Um, uh, you know, you, can, you, you work things out to, to, to six decimal places using quantum theory, and it, 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 it's no, there has been no failure detected in quantum theory at all. It's a magnificent theory. Um, but the rules of the theory are that... When you, when you set a particle off, it does this funny stuff and it's in both places at once, and then it collapses and, and so on and so on. Um, so that is what is hy hypothesized in the theory. We have, and as, as I say, you, you can't, you, you can, you, all you see is the end result. You don't, you don't see what's in between. Yeah. Have they ever tried to put, for example, dogs as an observer? Uh, no. Um, um, and, and the... It, it, I, th I think I'll, I'll come to the, that a little later on. I mean, um, th of course, this is where Schrodinger's cat comes in. But, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so let's, um, I mean, there are all sorts of things. Let's, let's pick that up later. I, th I think you've got the general, general gist of it so far, I think, yeah. Um, uh, um, so w the, the reaction to this... Um, what did people think of it? People were, um, I think, physicists were somewhat embarrassed by it. I mean, um, the, uh, the book by um, von Neumann um, became, and, and still is in fact, a, 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 the standard um, textbook on quantum theory for a long time. Uh, linking it to consciousness um, was something which physicists found was, was something of, a, of an embarrassment. And, I mean, there are two, there are two problems. Um, uh, on the one hand, um, the, it was a relief uh, <laughs> and, uh, that, that something was known. But on the other hand, um, uh, we don't understand consciousness, so it doesn't really help much get, having everything explained by consciousness. Um, and, in fact, uh, the, the, let, let me sort of... Uh, e expand on this, expand on the reactions of physicists uh, to this. Um, the, because people were rather embarrassed with this idea of bringing in consciousness, an alternative uh, way of looking at things was produced. And this is what point one there uh, yeah, is about. And the, the MSC people will be hearing more about this next week. Um, the I'm not going to attempt to sort of uh, explain this here, but the, the general idea is that um, if, we, if we go back to, to that, um, to, to, to this thing, if we go back to this, then um, I, the, this, this is supposed to be a vacuum chamber. We've got these particles buzzing around in here. Um, we ignore what's going on all around about it. In fact, um, these particles are interacting very weakly with the whole environment around them. 
Um, there are um, uh, electromagnetic waves uh, cross crossing this and in interfering with the particles. Um, there's the gravitational field interfering with them and, and connecting with them. Uh, these are actually all in communication with the world around them. And uh, what uh, Tsei and company um, pr uh, proposed was that it's actually not uh, the particular observer who is standing there, but actually the entire mass of the universe around it interacting with the particles which is doing this. And so what matters is not the fact that the observer is conscious, um, what matters is that the observer and everything else around it is massive and they're emitting radiation and things like that which is interacting with the particle. Um, so this was thought to be uh, a way out um, without uh, actually having to invoke consciousness. Um, and that was an enormous relief. This happened in uh, 1970 uh, because people didn't have to worry about this difficult thing, consciousness. Um, now, there's a whole lots of uh, other arguments which uh, can be built around this. Um, uh, I'm, I'm pretty clear that Tse's argument uh, is, um, is not sufficient, that in fact it doesn't work. Uh, the, the effect that he's talking about is there, but it doesn't actually deliver the goods. Um, but there are, there are obviously lots more details there to, to be looked at. Um, so that's this... Um, uh, argument which uh, w the course will be looking at later on. I, there's an easier way of understanding uh, th the depth of the problem which is going on, which is this, this uh, cosmology connection. Uh, so I want to talk about this because uh, it sort of, it doesn't solve the problem, it just sort of raises the problem to uh, um, a higher level in a sense, but that so somehow makes it more graspable. Um, so this is, I referred to this uh, a bit earlier, it's this satellite, the WMAP satellite, um, which is launched to observe the radiation that comes from the very early stages of the universe. Um, you, you've probably heard of um, the, the microwave uh, black body radiation, some of you perhaps, a few knobs around. Um, it's, um, it was originally found by a couple of telephone engineers, Penzias and Wilson, who were building part of a telephone network where they were committing, uh, transmitting telephone signals um, by microwaves, the way it's done now. Um, and there was this sort of constant hissing noise on their, uh, on, on their transmission, which seemed to be ev everywhere, uh, no matter which way they pointed their aerials in. This was very mysterious and eventually it was uh, tracked down to a uniform uh, flood of radiation from everywhere in the sky uh, which um, by elimination was uh, attributed to the very early stages in the universe before galaxies formed when the universe was almost completely smooth. Um, and so this observation prompted an awful lot of um, thinking about what was going on uh, in, in the early universe and one dominant theory was that the way to look at the very early universe was to go right back to the time when the uh, universe uh, was of quantum size and, and say let's look at the state where the universe itself was uh, a, a quantum system and uh, then uh, uh, this is the uh, picture which the, 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 uh, that satellite produced. Um, what this is a picture of is the, this radiation is almost perfectly uniform, but it has very slight fluctuations. Uh, it varies very slightly in intensity by about one part in 10,000 from place to place. And this is a, a picture of those very small fluctuations. Um, Computer simulations um, sh uh, show that uh, if you look at what will happen to those little fluctuations, which rep also represent fluctuations in the density of the matter, how they evolve, you find that they evolve into uh, strands of matter. I haven't got the, the picture of that, this here, but which uh, it, they then evolve into stars and galaxies and things, and the pattern of uh, 
of variations that you can see here matches very well the, the patterns uh, of the superclusters of galaxies that we now have. So it's very strong evidence that um, uh, this uh, situation does evolve naturally into the situation we see ourselves in. Um, and you would therefore expect that uh, you could perhaps explain this sort of thing by quantum phenomena. And uh, Brian Greene uh, had this uh, uh, statement made when this picture appeared, the galaxies are quantum fluctuations writ large across the sky. Um, I will be saying things in the course about why that is nonsense, but um, <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is where we were then. Um, and uh, <coughs> let's, uh, let's suppose this is true, and, and up to a point it is true, it's just the, the details are uh, uh, a bit more complicated than that. Let's suppose this is true, that the universe started off as a single quantum system uh, and then started uh, evolving. Now, if the universe as a whole is a single quantum system, there is no observer outside it to observe it except God, uh, if you go in for God. Uh, most physicists don't go in for God, and so this doesn't help. Um, actually, strictly speaking, that's not true. The majority, of, uh, if you, if you, there have been polls done of, science, of scientists, and actually, um, contrary to what Dawkins says, um, the, the majority of physicists across the world do believe in God, uh, but um, they keep it in a separate box, is the point. <laughs> so, uh, even, if, even if a physicist does believe in God, he doesn't like the idea of God sort of poking around with the universe. Um, uh, so, um, the, this means that we are, in, uh, we are inside uh, a system which uh, was originally a quantum system. There is no observer um, relevant to physics outside this system to uh, cause it to collapse into something uh, classical, and therefore this system will continue to be a quantum system. Um, but um, we are not here in a quantum superposition. I am, I am here, Shas Satish is there. Um, there is no muddling about what's going on. Everything is solidly classical. There is something very fundamentally uh, so that wrong means with it. That since there is no observer outside, yes, it's to, it's within the system, everything is observer that, and the observer. At that's the same right. Time. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but it means that there is then no mechanism for uh, for a quantum collapse taking place, because essentially we we are a single quantum system. And the observer has to be outside the system in order to cause it to collapse. Mm -hmm. uh, so th this is the sort of uh, the, the fundamental reason why one has to th think about this in a different way. Why the uh, the, the the conventional um, assumption th that uh, that say made uh, Hans Dieter say, which I quoted uh, just now, that it's to do with the interaction between matter and, and the particle. Uh, won't do because the, uh, there, isn't, there is nothing outside to actually cause this to happen. When, 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 a, when um, consciousness causes the, quant the quantum system to collapse, mm. you then the quantum system stops being a quantum system? Uh, no. Um, the, it's, 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 it switches from being what, from one quantum system to a different quantum system. Um, yeah. Um, now I now need to say, um, and, uh, can, can I have guidance on time? Um, I, yeah, till nine o'clock. Uh, yeah, I'll. I'll, I'll uh, well, so as you've had some questions. Yeah. Ten past nine. Well, I'll, I'll, no, I, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'll, I'll, cer I'll certainly, I'll certainly stop by nine. So that's that, yeah, that's all right. Good. Yeah. Um, uh, so, but we we need to say. <laughs> um, uh, the, the, the timing is fine because I wanted to spend the longest on the quantum theory, but we now need to do a bit on consciousness. Um, so um, let, let's let's now look at consciousness. And, um, it's clear that we have to do, we have to bring consciousness in. Uh, these other ideas, um, uh, I think, uh, are not adequate. So um, and we now go back to that point I had earlier. Um, okay, but, we, but consciousness is a mystery as well. So, so let, me, let me say a bit about uh, where we are with consciousness and the problems with consciousness. Um, the, um, there's, 
no agreement about what the word consciousness means. I mean, it is, it, there is quite incredible confusion around all this. If you, uh, if, if you read uh, conference proceedings uh, on confer from conferences about consciousness, um, you will find uh, it consists entirely of debates between people who are using the word in different ways and don't realize it, and uh, it, it, it's chaotic, it really is. Um, so uh, I, I want, to, want to say a bit about that and, and what's going on and just give you a quick sketch of, of sort of attempts to sort of grasp and give a, a particular definition to consciousness and say what, what is a good thing to have it, have it mean for this purpose. Um, and one of the first people to investigate this was Alan Turing, um, who was asking the question um, sort of uh, whether computers are conscious or not. Um, and, uh, uh, oh, I'll, I'm going to skip this one. Um, this is just um, all the variety of different explanations which people have produced. Um, uh, um, so we're here and we're looking at uh, Turing's question is, can a computer be conscious? Um, and what uh, Turing suggested was a, uh, a, a test, what would be the criteria and how would you try and find out whether or not uh, a computer was conscious or could be conscious. Um, and more precisely what Turing said was that um, is, are there, can you imagine or even construct, well this was very early on so it would be imagine, um, some sort of a computer which um, as for, which could pass all the tests you might think of to test it for consciousness. So uh, you imagine that you might be uh, typing questions into it and asking it questions about itself. Uh, could, could you have a computer which uh, would be so ingenious that um, you, could, you couldn't tell whether, or whether it was conscious or not and so as far as you could tell it might just as well be conscious. Uh, and um, you, you probably know there, uh, th this, there is actually an annual competition for this, um, that um, a competition of... Um, Isn't the consciousness uh, different from being conscious? Uh, well, ab yeah, ab absolutely, yes, yes, yes. And, and there are, um, yes, yeah. th 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 that's a key. But I'm, I'm just giving you a sort of historical summary of, of, of the way it was thought about. Um, and uh, so... The uh, Turing sort of um, proceeded through this, and uh, it, it, it's an interesting question. But it, it's, it's actually not about consciousness, it's about thinking. Um, the, what, 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 this, what questions like this boil down to, um, and I, I think this is in, in, in a way probably what, what, what you're referring to, Satish, um, is that um, is, is it possible for a computer to... Uh, accurately replicate, sufficiently accurately replicate human thinking and, and rational uh, calculations and speech and think, all that sort of thing in such a way that it's the same uh, as far as outside observation is concerned from the way human beings think. And why not? I mean, if, if by thinking you mean um, you know, calculating things, um, putting two and two together and making deductions, um, speaking, things like that. Um, yeah, well, in principle, why shouldn't uh, a, a computer uh, do, do this just as well? So um, Turing and a lot of people after him, um, in the course of discussing consciousness, surreptitiously turn it into thinking, uh, and actually they're missing the, the essential point of consciousness, which is, which is what it is like to have consciousness. Uh, consciousness is awareness, Consciousness uh, is a totally subjective uh, awareness and knowing of what you are thinking, of what you are seeing. Uh, it's at a different level altogether from this. Um, and so <coughs> this is the, the process. Daniel Dennett is one of, one of the most um, uh, uh, influential writers on uh, consciousness. He has this fat book called Consciousness, as Expla uh, Consciousness Explained uh, and he essentially just reduces it to um, neurology and that does it as far as he's concerned. 
but the, uh, the, the essence of consciousness, which uh, is what we're going to need to have if we're to uh, make it link up with quantum theory, uh, is that consciousness uh, has to do with our experience. Consciousness is human subjective experience. It is what, is, what it is like uh, to, um, to, to be in contact with something. Uh, and uh, I have a, quite a couple of quotes from very influential people. Um, the uh, Nagel, who, whoops, going the wrong way. Um, uh, Nagel, who uh, did this famous pe paper, what is, it, what is it like to be a bat, um, argued that consciousness is essentially this subjective experience, what it is like to be or know something. Uh, and Chalmers, who produced a, a, another very influential paper, saying that thinking, <coughs> that information processing, uh, is all very well, but there's also a subjective aspect, and that subjective aspect uh, is consciousness. So this is what um, uh, I and sort of people in my people who agree with me uh, think of as consciousness. <laughs> the, the good is <laughs> the most of the bad is. <laughs> um, uh, this, this, this is the definition that we, that we, we use of consciousness. Um, so, uh, <laughs> let, let's be blunt about this. Um, where are we? Um, I want to, um, I want to give a, a, a little, uh, where to be to go? I'm, I think I'm going to um, sort of cut to the chase at this point um, and um, skip the next bit, which is um, uh, uh, sort of more, more details about how consciousness could fit in with um, the, uh, the sort of things I've been talking about so far, in particular how it fits in uh, with the cosmological picture. Um, I'll, I'll just sort of shove a, 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 a slide on. Um, um, uh, just to sort of wave it in front of you, but the 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 sort of picture which um, I, I I think of in terms of um, and th this may or may not give you some very vague idea. Uh, this this is a sort of um, most of my life I, I spent doing general relativity, and so I I, I think I think in four dimensions. So, um, and this this is. Um, which is quite fun. Uh, th this is um, this is time and space. Uh, so this is this is a sort of uh, squashed flat version of the four-dimensional universe, and uh, I th I think of the universe as having sort of mom moments of awareness by conscious beings. Uh, these are interacting with each other through the laws of quantum mechanics, and uh, the. Uh, the, 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 the net, net effect uh, in past and future of these conscious uh, moments of awareness places a constraint on which, uh, which, sort, which evolutions of the universe actually manifest themselves. So it's, uh, I mean, there are issues about what happens if two people are looking at an experiment from, from opposite sides. Uh, and, and in fact, the whole thing is interlinked and the world is full of observers. And so the, the theory one needs is something which actually combines all the observers. It's a, it's a, a sort of panpsychist, literally a panpsychist view of things. Um, but I'm not going to say any, any more about that. Um, what I want to just get on to is the... Uh, I, keep, I keep sort of flashing the pointer at the computer and the computer at the other thing. Um, uh, um, I, I, let, let's go back to the thing I said right at the beginning, the, sort of the, the, the so what about this. Um, so suppose we sort all this out. Um, what difference does it actually make to us? Um, and I, I just want to sort of end, end on this note. Um, and the, f for me, what, what matters about quantum theory and the, the, the whole sort of story that I've told you so far um, is that it does give me, at any rate, um, a different sort of picture of the universe. It gives me a picture of, of the world that I'm in as um, because I'm, I'm forced to, by, by the physics, to a panpsychist position in which innumerable things are conscious. 
uh, and I'm forced by quantum theory to think of a situation where uh, all the conscious beings are linked together. Uh, this means that I find myself within an interconnected conscious universe. Um, and, uh, and that tends to be the uh, viewpoint which uh, a, a lot of people come to, very often from quite different routes. Um, the, the course here will be hearing a message very like that um, uh, um, from the guy at the end whose name escapes me, um, uh, Anit Goswami. Um, um, that, that's the point that he comes to at the end, though we, get, we come to it actually through quite different routes. Um, so, uh, in, in various different ways, uh, I and others come to the conclusion that we are in uh, an interconnected universe. We are in a universe, um, and the connections are subtle and difficult and um, not themselves conscious, and there are all complications about that. Um, but uh, we're in a universe where um, a vast range of beings uh, have an inner awareness of, of existence. Uh, in fact, an existence in themselves which is the same, of the same nature as our existence in ourselves. Um, and therefore, a vast range of beings potentially have values in themselves in the same way as we know we have values in ourself. Uh, and I think this actually shifts the morality of the whole thing because uh, whatever questions we can ask at the deepest level of ourselves um, are questions which we can also raise of innumerable other beings around us. And I think this, this, this is the most crucial message uh, of uh, these sort of arguments, that we have got to take this uh, inner, inner awareness of our own being and also empathic awareness of the similar being of other things. Uh, seriously as, as crucial components which actually makes the universe what it is rather than uh, just a, a, a vague swirl of undifferentiated matter. So l let's move into questions after Thank that. You. So I, I really identify with Chris's <laughs> directed <laughs> moments of awareness that are somehow shaping the reality we're in, and um, that all the significance of the world is coming um, th through through our being in these moments of awareness, and and that we, we we are aspiring to those moments just like everything else in the universe, right from the particle um, right up to to God. So let's have some questions. <laughs> um, Claude Curley spoke about a domain called superspace, mm -hmm. which is the domain beyond the, uh, the, the time-space dimension. He suggested it was kind of the, the information structure. Not the information itself, but the structure of the information of the world. Oh, this is different from Wheeler's superspace. Yes, right. Oh, okay, yeah. And yeah. David Bohm spoke about an implicate order mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. from which, through our engagement, progressively we're explicating this universe. Are those correlations, and is that related to Wheeler's? Uh, I, I, I don't know curling. Um, no, I, I, know the, I know the name, but I haven't read it. Um, the... Um, uh, Wheeler is not re uh, relevant. So uh, David Bohm is very relevant because um, David Bohm really knew his quantum mechanics and wrote a textbook on it. Um, and uh, that, that's certainly very important because his, um, uh, his sort of his implicate explicate order, and in particular his, um, uh, yeah, his idea of, of, of the idea that the universe was in some way sort of had hierarchies of uh, of explication and implication in his terminology, so that each each layer uh, of, of a given level acted as uh, an, a, an explication of the lower level further down. So, I mean, he had very much this picture of um, the universe in itself becoming aware of itself, uh, though not not strictly speaking as a whole. That sort of each. 
uh, we are aware of our, our, our lower level structures. So I think David Bohm picture is, which is very subtle, um, is sort of very relevant to that. And so this is his later work uh, on that sort of hierarchical implicate and explicate uh, uh, shuffling around order. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it comes in different versions, but the, ver the, the version later on I think is very relevant to this. Yeah. Sorry, who was that? I remember that. Say, say it again. What comes into your definition of beings on your slide? Beings, here? yes. Um, can you tell yeah. us what comes into well, I, I, well, I can tell you what it is on my theory. Um, the, um, it's to do with coherence. That um, if um, the, the the things which uh, can have uh, uh, an influence on quantum theory in, in this sort of way um, are systems which are uh, coherent in, in, a, in, a, in a technical sense. They sort of, uh, as quantum systems, uh, they're, they're sort of intermeshed with themselves, as it were. Um, and uh, the, there's, there's a precise definition which will not be relevant. Um, but, um, and so, what counts as uh, a, what the, a, th a thing which can carry consciousness, um, what used to be called the seat of consciousness very often, <coughs> a seat of consciousness, um, is uh, a, a maximal sized coherent uh, region which, which can't be any bigger without it becoming incoherent. Um, the, um, there, are, there are sort of pr problems about this, about what, what, what the, whether the size is right or not. Um, if you do a sort of um, uh, Hammeroff and Penrose in their work uh, take a, a slightly similar argument, though they don't go into the details of, of the size of the thing, uh, they want it to work on, on, on a really microscopic or well, sub-microscopic level, uh, which doesn't do much good. Um, the, the largest I can get it up to um, is about four millimeters, um, which um, might be good. Might be good enough in terms of mammalian brains, and uh, um, in, in, because the seat of consciousness doesn't necessarily have to be the whole body, as it were. So, uh, and so, and there are complications about how one sort of jacks that up. But, but, but so, this is a, a sort of tra tractable bit, bit of physics, uh, and, and so the idea is that um, that everything. Um, all, all, all coherent entities like that. Um, anything. The, it, it's very related to um, a paper which was published by Eichmann and During, which they entitled "What Is a Thing." <coughs> um, the, you, there's a, there's, a, there's a, um, a more famous paper by Heidegger called "What Is a Thing," uh, which is actually which they are parodying, and it's not actually relevant because Heidegger's is different. Um, but it, it's an important question. Uh, it's. Uh, what, they, what they want to say um, is that everything is conscious. This is panpsychism. Everything is conscious. But what is a thing? Um, the, if, I, if, I, you know, if, if I sort of take a system uh, which uh, consists of um, that projector and that's, that coat on the floor, um, that compound thing, it, it's, it's two things. Um, so in what sense is it two things? Well, they're in different places. Well, but why shouldn't they be connected electronically so that they actually acted as a single thing? Um, so you see what I'm getting at. Uh, if, if you're going to, I think it does make sense to say everything is conscious, um, but you need to actually um, then fill in uh, what you're going to mean by a thing. Um, so uh, look, look on my website, by the way. It's, it's, it's all over there. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Uh, Schrodinger's cat. Um, I, I, th I think we've, we've sort of dealt with Schrodinger's cat, haven't we? Because, I mean, Schrodinger's cat is conscious. Uh, the, the people surrounding it is conscious. Um, uh, we are all meshed together uh, w w within this mesh of consciousness in the universe, and we all participate in, uh, in, in what is going on. Um, uh, I th who, 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 who is next? Uh, shall I the sort of uh, you, you and the new one? It would be very awkward here, guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, if we have a, a thing, yeah. you say everything is, is conscious. Clearly, 
Yeah. You can understand that when we're dealing with living things. But in your understanding, what would be the difference in the sort of quality of consciousness between a living person and a dead person? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, the, 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 dif the difference is biological. But, um, but I mean, there's um, the... The, um, uh, it, 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 life comes in here as well. If it, what, what is the distinction between, between living, what is living, the difference between living and, and, and consciousness? What's, what's the relationship between living and consciousness? Um, I don't know. I mean, um, I, I think there's a real problem here because uh, there's a lot of very interesting work um, be, being done by Kaufman and, and others, which probably lots of you know about. Um, um, in, in terms of looking at what life is, in terms of chemical processes and biological processes. I mean, it, it's quite deep work and it's, it, it's really, really very important work. Um, uh, that's, uh, that's sort of quite separate. Uh, their life living is, de is defined in terms of the ability of uh, the system to actually act on its, in, uh, on its environment. Uh, in, in a particularly constructive sort of way. So um, it's not looking at the reproduction, it's looking at the extent to which a being can operate on its environment. Um, and so that, that's, that's, that's clearly fascinating and important, but I don't know how it actually links up with this stuff that I've been talking about. There's a, there's a real, real problem there, and I, I don't know what it is. Yeah. Important yeah. <laughs> yes, please. I, I um. would ask a similar question, but not in terms of between living and dead, uh. but between living beings. Are there, are there different qualities of consciousness mm. that work? I mean, mm. if, if somebody has a different quality of consciousness from another person, Will something happen to the to the quantum to the sil to the silver? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 yes, yes. Now, I mean, th this this is very important, um, sort of philosophically and psychologically. That that um, uh, once once you've once you've defined consciousness in terms of uh, of subjective awareness, then um, then there are sort of nuances within that. We all very often talk about. Um, having well, I mean, it, it, it's, it's standard practice in, uh, in spiritual teaching um, that there are, there, are, there are different depths and modes of consciousness, um, and on the other hand, these are all consciousness; they are all part of awareness. So, is there a sort of um, realm of qualities of consciousness going on there which are uh, independent of? The sort of the, the, the physical processes or, or what's going on there. I mean, the, the, the approach I tend to take is that there is, there is a single thing called uh, consciousness which is almost equivalent to being. Um, uh, I mean, it, it, it's something of, of that ontological stasis. Uh, and then within, on top of that, then you can ask, well, now what what, what, as, what aspect of that, what manifestation of that are you then uh, contacting, taking into yourself, exhibiting yourself, what, whatever. Uh, but, um, I mean, we need a much more refined language if we're to, to talk about this. So we, we, we're now sort of, the trouble is this word consciousness is stretched over far too, far too many things. Um, I'm, I'm losing track of um, uh, who, who comes in when. There's some, yeah. Is it somehow parallel to this? I mean, the elusiveness of trying to define consciousness uh -huh. seems to me similar to the elusiveness of trying to pin down quantum occurrences. Uh -huh. Quantum mm. mechanics? Um, the elusiveness, yeah, uh, well. And is that a link? I, I don't think it is. Because, well, well it, I mean, it's, it, it's, a link, it's a link in the sense that. Um, the, the elusiveness of trying, I think the elusiveness of trying to pin down quantum mechanics is that part of quantum mechanics is to do with consciousness. So there's only one elusiveness in there, it's the elusiveness of consciousness. Uh, but the reason why that is uh, elusive is the fundamental difference between our um, e experiencing being and uh, our observing the being of another. And what, what is going on with consciousness uh, is, is it is uh, the, the being of ourselves which we're talking about. 
Uh, and in fact, we're not talking about observation, um, except in so far as um, the uh, one quality of, of consciousness is a quality which arises from a sort of re reflexive process. But um, uh, I mean, I, I think, um, uh, yeah, I, 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 I think we, we, we need to sort of bring in more spiritual um, experienced people at this stage than I am. So um, that, that's, a, that's another category. Yeah, Charles? Uh, yeah, there's someone at the back. Yeah. What the role of linear time is within uh, an incoherent quantum state. Um, I was particularly interested by your network stretching through time and space and moments of self-awareness kind of forming this framework uh, for an almost self-aware universe. But that still raises a, uh, the question for me of causality um, from the initial conditions. Um, yeah. Um, the... Um Causality, um, the, there's two sorts of causality. There's um, a causality which arises from um, von Neumann's process two, the sort of smooth, law-like uh, evolution. Um, that's, that's, the, that's in the same category as Newtonian theory. Um, it's, Prigogine's done lo lots of work on that. Um, the, it's a causality, it's an, a connection which in itself goes equally backwards or forwards in time, but which in its actual display uh, only goes one way in time because of the expansion of the universe which generates entropy and all that sort of thing. Um, there is um, a, another sense of, of causation or a sort of pseudo-causation, which is the one we're talking about in quantum collapse. Um, which comes from, this is an argument by Don Page, that um, if you, 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 take, you, you consider this sort of quantum universe, which we, we, we think we're in on the basis of quantum cosmology, uh, and instead of thinking of this uh, smooth quantum universe as the universe as it, we actually um, observe it, we think of it as a, a sort of primal, uh, primal universe which determines the possible universes that are actually realized. And then the universes that are realized, um, uh, which uh, universe or universes, and I get a bit unsure about how, how to talk about this at, at this stage, uh, the, the uni a universe which is realized is one in which will support um, uh, awareness. Um, what, what we are given is that we are aware of something, therefore we are in a universe which has awareness. So the, the question we're really interested in is not um, what, what is the nature of, of any old universe, but what is the nature of um, universes, the sort of natural selection sort of procedure going on here. There might be millions of universes, but only, only some of them uh, actually support awareness. Um, we need more details on that. But now, in, in, if, if we look at this question, um, what universes support awareness, um, that is um, something which is selected as a result of uh, all the conscious uh, beings in the universe. Um, and there's a causality going on there, but it's not a causality which is generated by mechanical influences from one to the other. Um, it's a causality which is generated by the fact that the, um, the, 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 the presence of some, um, or, uh, some moments of awareness in a universe um, enhances the presence of others, if you just sort of look at the statistics of the thing. Uh, and so there's a sort of um, quasi-connection which goes equally well forwards and backwards. Um, and and I, I think this is testable. This is what's interesting. I think there are parapsychological experiments one can uh, design um, which, which can actually sort of test this sort of thing. Um, was to, to what extent do things run equally forwards and backwards? I have precognitive dreams, so I'm, I'm quite interested in this. <laughs> yeah, being analogous to uh, the intuitive mind. Yes, yes. I wonder if you could just 
talk a bit more about it. No, I'd love to. This is, this is um, the work of Ignacio Mati Blanco. Um, does anyone know Mati, uh, Mati Blanco? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, good. Um, the, he, um, uh, I mean, it's, it's somewhat, I, I find his work is somewhat lacking in evidence, um, which slightly worries me. But uh, he, he proposed that um, from his, from his, uh, he's, he was, um, uh, I suppose he was a psychiatrist, we, we, we would say, but uh, certainly a, a psychologist, um, uh, yeah, and, and a, a, a psychoanalytic psychiatrist. Um, and he, on, on the basis of his observations of his patients, he uh, felt that the best way of describing what, uh, th what they were saying was uh, that it is as if they were um, using a different logic. And since he was a Freudian, he talked about the unconscious. Uh, and his unconscious is essentially the same as my consciousness, which is sort of <laughs> slightly confusing. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, but if you think about it, it doesn't make sense, actually. But, uh, but he was saying that the, the, the unconscious, the Freudian unconscious, uh, in his case, behaves as if it were operating on a different logic. And this different logic differs from ordinary Aristotelian logic uh, in that all its relationships are symmetric. Um, th that um, uh, if it is the case that I hate my dog, then this implies that my dog hates me. Well, this may well be true because of the uh, human interaction, but it, it's, it's the case for, for um, all, uh, all relationships. Um, and this, uh, this, this sounds batty, but when you start, um, when you, if you read his material, and also if you start looking at your dreams, um, this starts to sound uh, quite, quite plausible in, in, in a way. And it sort of ties in a bit with um, you know, reciprocal roles uh, in mutual abuse and things like this. The, there, there is a sense in which the, um, the, the, the deeper layers of our psyche um, look as if they uh, obey this, what Matty Blanco called biologic, which is logic in which relationships are symmetrical. Um, th this is a context-dependent logic. Um, it's a logic uh, where um, you're in, in life you're continually uh, in, a, in a context which is shifting from one thing to another. Uh, and so an assertion which uh, is, I, I would, might make um, in, uh, in two minutes' time could formally um, contradict a statement I've just uh, made now uh, quite probably because I've just got in a muddle, but also legitimately because the context has shifted uh, into a different context. Um, and th it's that sort of context dependence um, uh, in particular which is going on um, in uh, this alternative logic for quantum theory which is called topos logic. Um, and, uh, and in a way it's the context dependence uh, aspect of it, which is more important, I think, than the, 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 sy the symmetry part of it. Um, but, um, um, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of <laughs> that, that's, that's the sort of area I, I, I'm, I'm trying to pin down, anyway. Um, yeah, each other. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm just curious about what consists of collective consciousness and what will shift the collective mm. consciousness. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, so am I. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm, I suppose the, the, the question here is, is um, do, does there exist uh, a collective consciousness in the sense in which I was defining consciousness? Um, and I'm, I'm thoroughly torn here because spiritually I think there is. Uh, and from the physics um, I can't fit it in. <laughs> so, um, uh, I mean... Um, it's, uh, I mean, one possibility uh, could be that um, the, what, what, what we would call collective consciousness um, is, is simply a term for the, the sort of the, the, the union and the communication of individual consciousnesses. But on the other hand, I sort of feel in my guts that there is such a thing as collective consciousness. So. <laughs> yeah. This work to be forwarded, do you think? Is it through the scientific method, which, which um, obviously involves ob observation, or through spiritual development? 
um, forwarded in the sense of our understanding of, of what's going on. Um, uh, I, I, I would say both. Um, but I mean, actually, um, pr uh, probably the, 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 the spiritual information is already there. Um, and in, in, um, in, in Madhyamaka Buddhism, for instance, an enormous amount of detail uh, ab about different, uh, different levels of consciousness, and in particular the um, oh, um, uh, uh, Wallace um, in, in, in the book, I um, can't remember the name, Thin, thin Black Book, uh, who, 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 who uh, did, did work with a team convened by the Dalai Lama looking at different uh, levels of, of Rigpa. Um, uh, was arguing, Alan Wallace, uh, was, was arguing that um, there were very strong correspondences between uh, different levels of, of Tibetan Rigpa and uh, the early stages of, of the universe when the universe was an entire quantum state. So the, there's a sort of the material uh, on, on, on the spiritual side there, I think. Um, what it, I think the difficulty then comes from um, uh, I mean, what, what, this, what this feeds into very much is the, the polarity in our own minds. That um, we, um, the, there, there is, I'm, I'm very strongly influenced by um, the work of McGilchrist and uh, in particular b before McGilchrist um, by Teasdale and Barnard on, on the polarity of the mind between uh, what one might call the intuitive side and what, what, what one might call the rational side. Um, and um, I think it's, it's actually acknowledging that polarity uh, in, our own, in our own ways of knowing um, and then having acknowledged that polarity and experiencing that polarity, then to look at ways in which uh, we can um, enhance the unity of those two ways of knowing in ourselves um, by, um, by, by sort of l learning languages to go from one to the other. And that goes over into, uh, in, into the whole of science, that we need languages in which we can uh, tr translate from uh, what, we're, what we understand from our spiritual experience across to what we understand with our intellectual experience. And I think that is actually where the work needs to be done, because at the moment uh, the scientists and the, religion and the spiritual practitioners uh, are in most cases not listening to each other, even if they try to talk to each other, and very often not because of sheer bloody-mindedness like um, some people I can mention, uh, but um, beginning with D, but um, <laughs> uh, but um, the, uh, be, uh, simply because the, uh, we, we haven't got the languages and the sort of the, the mental techniques to actually do the, do the, do the connect, make the connections. Uh, and so, as a result, you, you can bring people together and you can have, you can have good natured, good willing conversation, but we actually we haven't got the sort of mental tools to do that joining up. Uh, and I think that's where the work actually needs to be done. Hey, Jeffrey? Yeah. Um, can the human mind direct a stream of consciousness to another being? Um, I've been doing a lot of experiments personally with most of the persistent flying around in the kitchen and stuff, and seeing how they are affected by my stream of consciousness. And yeah. they really are, yes. and, they, and I think it isn't just the magnetic or the, the field of aura around you, it's definitely, it, because I can be near these folks, mm. and they don't take any notice. But if I direct, and, and they know what I'm thinking, I'm going to get you, sort of, <laughs> They immediately, and they're very, very clever, they just wrap, they go elsewhere, they wrap around, and even if you swat at them, they stay straight away. So it's like Sheldrake's work, you know, I'm fascinated with that. Can, can the human mind direct a stream of consciousness? Yes, I mean, this, this, this goes sort of back to this problem I, uh, I, we, we've talked about um, in, in other contexts just now, that, that you know, what, what's the relationship between a combination of minds and, and an individual mind? And I mean, I think what you say is true. I mean, I think most people could sort of cite examples of this from, uh, from their own experience. And, uh, and, and in a way, if, if one wants to um, 
ex explain some parapsychological effects, the most natural way is to think in terms of um, that, that sort of um, amalgamation of minds or minds c connecting up uh, and, and even doing it by actual acts of will as you're describing. Uh, it's uh, surprising but that, really, mm. what surprises me is that a tiny little bug like that mm. has this level of, if you like, consciousness. You can yes. understand what's coming out of I, I mean, the, uh, <laughs> the, and what, what, one interesting thing about bugs, if, if one looks at fruit flies, those favorite things of um, uh, of, of physicists and biologists. Um, fruit flies are one of the few organisms which, uh, for which there is good evidence that they are quantum controlled, uh, that they, they sort of veer in their flight uh, in, in a random way which is, which is quite plausibly quantum generated. So maybe fruit flies are the things to sort of start working on. So we've got time for a couple more questions. Uh, the back there. Um, Mm. So uh, how, uh, how, do we, how do we actually um, know that we are conscious and we are not just observing consciousness? Um, the, the definition I was taking was that, uh, that um, con consciousness, the word consciousness means awareness. Um, so, uh, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's the sort of, in a way it's the most obvious definition. It's, uh, when we are in a deep, dreamless sleep, we are not conscious. There is no awareness. When we are dreaming, uh, or uh, in, uh, as we are in here, no one is asleep as far as I can tell, um, then, then we are conscious. Um, so um, there, the, the answer to what you say is that there is no difference, that uh, the sort of rock-bottom consciousness uh, is, is whenever there is awareness. And then what, what the nature of that awareness are then sort of additional qualities and it becomes the content of consciousness, if you like. That there is consciousness itself and then there is the question of what is the contents of that consciousness. In other words, what are we aware of? Uh, and we can be aware of different things and, and so on. But it, it, it is simply awareness and nothing else. Um, I'm very interested in the collapse of the particle. Um, mm -hmm. I wonder if that has to do with us making the world as we see it, um, in the mm. way that we interact with life, mm. rather like the stock market and the faith that people have when it goes up and then the depression when it goes down. I mean, would that have a, a quantum fluctuation going on there? The, the thing I mean, that's a mass yes. confidence, isn't it? In the, the thing about um, quantum collapse is that um, there is the, uh, there is no way, as far as I or anyone else can uh, can see, uh, with some qualifications, uh, that, that in which one can make the collapse go one way than, uh, than another. I mean, in the basic quantum mechanical situation, um, however you think about it, um, the uh, in the original pictures I, I produced, the observer. Uh, causes a collapse, but the observer has no control on what the collapse is to. It's a collapse to something entirely random. Now, if you, um, if you, uh, there, there are ways of modifying that uh, in, in quantum theory. There is a thing called the Zeno effect, um, which it, um, is a, named after Zeno's, Zeno's paradox that um, uh, you know the paradox of the arrow or the hair that you, the, the arrow cannot get from here to there because in order to get from here to there, it can, it's got, first of all, got to get and all that sort of stuff. Um, uh, it's, uh, in, it's, as far as I can see, it is possible for you to force something to happen by uh, observing it occasionally, and then um, when you observe it and it's actually where you want it, you then observe it very rapidly. And by observing it very rapidly, you keep it where it is. Um, and <laughs> and um, so, so, I mean, there are mecha this mechanism might give you a way of actually um, sort of influencing what, what, what's going on, either, either consciously or, or, um, or, or sort of unconsciously as a sort of group mind sort of thing. Uh, but it, it's, um, like, that, that's sort of all work in progress. Well, unconsciousness and intuition are different aspects oh, yes. of yes. the invisible, if you like. So yes. you're dealing with, mm. uh, with mm. the, the magnetic forces, no. the electromagnetism? No, no, no that, that's, new, that's Newtonian physics, that's clunky. 
<laughs> I'm trying to break where, where, down where, earth. Yes. No. <laughs> no, that's Newton. <laughs> There's no way of influencing it. It does what it does. It behaves the laws and that's it. <laughs> well, electromagnetic field. So where does intuition come in then, if it behaves yeah. as it does? No, yeah, intuition comes in the, 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 at this other level, uh, at, at, the le at, at the quantum level, at the level of consciousness. So intuition is in inhabiting unconsciousness somehow? Um, I think we'll have to continue this sort of uh, <laughs> later on. We need to talk about what we mean by intuition and the ambiguities there. Yeah, because I think we, we've really uncovered there is a different type of reality. And if we all think we know what, who we were when we came here, I hope none of you know who you are when you <laughs> <laughs> simple task to thank Chris. <laughs> Before I do, I would like to let you know that Chris is also involved with something called Green Spirit. And there's a magazine, Green Spirit, mm -hmm. if you are interested to follow this. And this quote there, the result of understanding quantum and consciousness is that all beings have value in themselves. That's the kind of uh, that's the kind of mission statement of quantum mm -hmm. mechanics and consciousness. <laughs> and if we can take that with us, then all the subtleties of argument that we've been through <laughs> will all put, f fall in place. Yeah. Yeah. Also, this holistic science idea, I want to inform you, some of you already know, but some of you don't, that there is a journal coming out called Journal of Holistic Science. If you want to follow these ideas on a regular basis, Philip and many are producing that. So please go to get in touch with them and find some copies. And if you can, subscribe to that. So with those informative words, also I would like to mention that uh, Chris has brought some books. Very few. Very few. I had a very, very, I had a very small bag. But also, uh, also the, 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 the books I brought contain um, two, two books by my wife on um, almost the same subject. We, we, we work together on this. So yeah, so um, those books will be available <laughs> in the tea area. There will be chai, tea, our regular chai. And so in that area, those books will be available. And if you will ask politely and nicely, I'm sure Chris would be happy to autograph, <laughs> autograph the book, sign the book. So please buy if they are, uh, if, as long as they last. They are, small numbers <laughs> so so get them quickly so with those words i would like to thank chris for illuminating and enlightening us with this very subtle and very obscure theory of <laughs> quantum and, and and quantum mechanics and consciousness what i in a very lay person's way take it is the quantum word comes from quantity so when the quantity is married with quality of consciousness, mm -hmm. it becomes quantum. <laughs> yeah, that that the good. essence of what you just said. Very good. Very good. <laughs> so even a lay person like me can be enlightened <laughs> by Chris. So Chris, you have presented so wonderfully the whole um, subject matter of quantum and consciousness and answered questions so uh, well and so clearly, so we would like to, all of us would like to thank you for your wonderful presentation. <laughs> this has been around at a theoretical level for quite a long time, for 40, 40, 30 years or so. Um, but with the um, recent launch of um, satellites, one particular satellite, uh, which I'll say a bit about later. This is now being turned into a purely theoretical uh, way of investigation into something which has a, a practical observational backup. So that means that quantum theory not only deals with little things, it deals with the entire cosmos of which we are ourselves part. So it's um, saying that actually whatever you think about it, uh, it's something which really is global at all length scales. Um, and then, um, finally, and for me what's most interesting actually, is that fairly recent work over the last 10 years or so um, suggests that the best way of looking at quantum theory is to say 
that quantum theory suggests that we ought to use actually a different sort of logic. Um, and th the sort of logic which uh, is thought of in this context is the sort of logic which some psychologists have been looking at as a way of understanding the intuitive part of our mind. So there's an interesting sort of uh, link there which um, s starts to suggest that there's some quite big shift going on here in, in the way we need to think about things. We need to adopt a, a different sort of logic. So that's the sort of um, picture in, in sort of very broad brush terms. So now I want to get down to the, to the nitty-gritty of quantum theory and, and tell you a bit about it. And I think the easiest thing is to make a comparison between quantum theory and the theory which came before quantum theory. So um, I'm going to look at comparing classical theory to quantum theory. And the, the reason why these particular dates are on there um, is that um, I, I've chosen the start of classical theory as the, the date of the publication of Newton's Principia. And we could probably just tweak this a little teeny bit in that direction. Yeah. Um, and uh, at, at the other end, uh, warning that you will probably hear different accounts of it. In fact, I know you will certainly hear at least uh, two more different accounts of it uh, in, in, in the course of the course that's going on. Um, so the ideas about what quantum theory are, they uh, come in two extremes, really. So one, one, one extreme, there is the view that quantum theory... Right, I need to stand somewhere where I'm not blocking the screen from people at this side. Um, one view is that um, uh, quantum theory is just about the physics of particles. It's, it's a... Uh, complicated theory, more sophisticated than ordinary Newtonian theory about how particles behave, and that's it. At the other extreme, um, there's uh, the, the idea that quantum theory really is the key to, to everything in the universe. That in some way quantum theory uh, is some, something universal, uh, a way into universal mind covering the entire cosmos. Um, and I'm going to be sort of somewhere in, in, in between the two of these things. Um, the, so let's, let's sort of get started on some specific points of this. Um, before I, I want to outline a few points which suggest that quantum theory really must have something interesting in it, whatever it is. The first of these um, is uh, that... Whatever you read about quantum theory, it goes on about the observer. Now, who or what the observer is, is a contested issue. But, um, okay, we are observers. I mean, you know, we look at things, we experience things. So observers are us. So, uh, if, uh, if observers are essential, if this is sort of what it's all about, then um, this sounds as though it's potentially interesting and could well be, have a bit to do with consciousness. Um, then uh, there's uh, something which really has only got dominant in the last uh, five, ten years or so. Um, there's been a, a burgeoning of interest in quantum cosmology, in the applications uh, of quantum theory to the very early stages of the universe. Experiencing the world. And um, from then on, he wrote some amazing papers about how you can understand um, quantum theory as, as the knowing of the particle, rather than there is a knowledge to be gained about some static entity. And, um, um, and so I, I got to know Chris through finding his website and understanding that um, what he is doing has tremendous relevance to, to the questions we are discussing at Schumacher College, and yet he's come through this very different um, avenue and gateway to, to get to the same point and the same questions about how can we expand the, way, the ways we have of understanding the world. And so um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Chris and for us to listen to this very fascinating talk. <laughs> Oh, 
thank you very much for coming and listening to me. <laughs> and um, I hope you stick the course. Because uh, <laughs> I, I want to try and actually uh, explain something about uh, what quantum theory is and something about uh, what consciousness is and something about how they are connected and I think these three topics are probably the least understood and the most difficult to explain that are around uh, and I think it's generally reckoned that attempting to give a popular exposition of quantum theory is really courting disaster so um, I, I would like you to assist me in, in this perilous task uh, by signalling if I have totally lost you, uh, by waving your hand in the air or uh, frowning or beating your fist on your brow or whatever uh, <laughs> means you think might be appropriate. Uh, and uh, I, I will try and rescue you. I think we, we should have a fair amount of time available uh, to sort of explore things at the end, but we'll, we'll, we'll see how we get on. Um, so, um, Quantum theory and consciousness, and um, quantumlaserpointers.com. Quantum laser pointers brings you the infamous double slit experiment right in the palm of your hand. In 1801, English physicist Thomas Young performed this experiment to determine if light was a particle or a wave. A laser shines a coherent beam of light through a film disc containing two parallel slits. Light striking the wall behind the slits produces a classic interference pattern. This surprising result means light passes through the parallel slits not as particles but as waves. Visit our website or subscribe to our YouTube channel now. Be among the first to see our new line of double slit lasers, quantumlaserpointers.com. We're very lucky to have um, Chris Clark here to, to talk about quantum theory and consciousness tonight. And he's really going to give us a taste of the short course by talking, um, giving a kind of introduction to, to, to where quantum theory and, and consciousness can um, interweave. In their, in, their, in, in our separate understandings about them. And w in, in, our work, in our inquiry that we have at the college, and especially on the MSc in Holistic Science, we're often um, asking deep questions. So today we've been reading essays and having dialogues about the nature of wholeness and how to communicate it. Um, but Chris has... Um, come to, to questions of wholeness um, through a def very different avenue in that he was um, professor of mathematics at Southampton University and um, w was very much deep into a mathematical worldview before at the age of 40 as he told me this evening suddenly having a shift in, into a completely different knowing about the world a much more um, spiritual and um, in, in, in emotional knowing about how one can understand directly from... Ex First of all, um, what are quantum theory and what is consciousness? Um, certainly they're very important. Um, consciousness is the most basic thing that uh, we have. We are, consciousness is us, if you like. Uh, it is our window on the whole of being. So uh, consciousness is absolutely at the root of being human. Of be and I would like to extend this to other species as well, as you will see later on. Um, but uh, then there is quantum theory. Uh, and why? What has uh, consciousness and quantum theory, what have they got to do with each other? Um, so, first of all, we need to ask, well, what is quantum theory? And this is what I'll start off uh, by trying to give you an idea uh, about. I think probably if you get through this bit, then the next bit um, might be more downhill going. Um, 
there's uh, an enormous gulf here. I want to sort of really explain w uh, part of what the confusion is. There's an enormous gulf between, on the one hand, uh, professional physicists and, um, on, on the other hand, people whose main concern is to uh, go from uh, quantum theory to more, a more spiritual understanding of things and uh, just using quantum theory as a sort of jumping off point. I'm fairly passionate about um, having to, uh, uh, the necessity of actually engaging scientists and uh, drawing on the whole wealth of quantum theory uh, as, as, a, as a whole theory. And so you'll find, in fact, that uh, there are a lot of expositions of quantum theory which, uh, first of all, they're, they're all different, uh, and this is one thing you've got to put up with. There's a lot of scientific accounts of quantum theory which are all different, uh, and uh, lots of contradictions between them. So it's not, a, not a, an easy territory to cross. Um, so I, I want to try and give what I think is the sort of mainstream aspects of quantum theory uh, as, as recognized in um, uh, physics as a whole, uh, but with a